<laughs> yeah, well, it's great to be among pastors today, and uh, thank you so much, Dave, for uh, just your friendship. I, I know that as a pastor, you feel the same way I do. It's great to have a pastor's advocate like a David <coughs> Parker, uh that really comes alongside of us, that encourages us, and uh, that, that lifts up our arms, because so many times as pastors, uh, we're defeated, and it only takes one email, right? It just takes one email to destroy your whole week, no matter how good you felt like you preached Sunday. And uh, can I get a witness this morning? And uh, so we're, we're very grateful. What an honor it is to be here with you. Every time I come to Bartow County, I'm just excited to hear about Kingdom Advance and how uh, your churches are shining the light of Jesus and demonstrating uh, the love of Jesus in this entire region of Georgia. So it's great to be a partner with you, great to be a fellow pastor with you and uh, be able to journey with you. Uh, what I'll be sharing with you today is just so deeply transformational. It's been something that has uh, changed the whole uh, dynamic of my life and I've been on this journey uh, now for many years and as David just uh, described, our church at one time was a, a great church. It was one of the only uh, uh, mega churches in the southeast and uh, through time, you know, it just diminished and uh, right now we're just seeing a wonderful uh, repurposing, re-envisioning, uh, re-transformation -tran of the church and uh, it's so exciting. So we'll share some of that along with you today. But, but the reason I'm here today is I, I love just to invite you to a relationship. Uh, I'd like to just invite you on a journey. And uh, so many times I know as a pastor I've gone to uh, different conferences and heard great preachers and left more discouraged than when I first came. Can I get a witness today? Anybody ever, ever that ever happened to you? But this, what we're talking uh, today about inviting you to it is a uh, journey that removes aloneness in our life as a pastor. Because many times as a pastor, we feel like we're the only one. We're the only one that had a family that just told us last week that they found a church closer to them that uh, fits more of who they are. Or maybe we're the, we're the only pastor that uh, has experienced uh, maybe uh, leading on empty, emotional burnout in, in life. And maybe sometimes we feel like we're the only pastor. Can I make it another year? Can I make it another five years in ministry? Uh, but what this journey does is it removes aloneness and it takes us from wherever we're at personally as a pastor and also uh, those in our church, leadership in our church, and takes us to a next level. And so uh, we're going to be talking uh, in journey. So I want to invite you to be a part of that. Uh, David will tell you more about it, but there is a, there's a gifting uh, for the first 25 uh, uh, pastors that want to list uh, their churches in this in Bartow County through uh, gracious giving of uh, kingdom sowing into so it's going to be a uh, wonderful transformation uh, and uh, just to let you know we're doing this in the Atlanta area we have 35 churches in the Atlanta area uh, that are part of this uh, we're doing it um, uh, we're in uh, Indiana uh, uh, Indianapolis Indiana uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma, Dallas, Texas, Tampa, Florida. So this movement of Call to Love is very powerful and transformational uh, in that. So uh, just, uh, just picture with me what the, the church in the first century was like. You can get the picture, uh, Acts, chapter, uh, Acts chapter 1, the gospel going from Jerusalem, uh, crossing over to Judea and then going into some cultural boundaries of Samaria and then really breaking cultures going into the uttermost parts of the earth. In Acts chapter 17, uh, we read about uh, how the church was criticized by unbelievers in the first century. Uh, these are the ones who have done what? Turned the world upside down. Really, they were turning it right side up, but they uh, felt like it was turning upside down. So uh, the question that we have to ask uh, in, in this room, why is it uh, that the church in the 21st century, particularly the Western church where we're, the context we're at, why aren't we multiplying, why aren't we uh, impacting the community, the culture around us like the church in the first century? And, uh, and so that's the, that's the challenge that we face. Now, uh, my background, this is my 30th year pastoring. I had the privilege uh, for three years of serving uh, you and uh, our uh, North American Mission Board 
uh, in a pastor for pastor relationships, uh, just basically giving air support to what the guys on the ground, David and Tim and others uh, do uh, day by day. Uh, but this is what I found. I got to go to almost every state convention and the Southern Baptist Convention uh, doing these church revitalization conferences with Johnny Hunt. And uh, this is what I found, is that the church in America is in a major problem. And it's just not a Southern Baptist issue, it's across all denominations and all movements. And the, the challenge that we're facing is this, is that we are missing the next generation. Uh, there's not one denomination or one movement would say that we're doing a great job passing our faith on uh, to the next generation. Uh, another uh, major problem is this, is that our churches, even though we gather on campuses, are not making much difference and impact uh, in the community. And so we're not, we don't look anything like what the community looks like as far as diversity and makeup and the demographics of that. And, uh, and so if, if you look at the church in Africa, uh, they're planting hundreds of churches, seeing thousands of people say, uh, I don't know if you've heard about the church in Iran, fastest growing church in, in the world is in Iran. And uh, they're seeing thousands of people come to faith in Christ. Many of them are being martyred uh, within uh, a month or so after their conversions. But it's just amazing uh, what's taking place. They have no buildings. They have no seminaries. They have no resources. They have no uh, learning tools that you and I do. Many of them don't even have a copy of God's word, and yet they're impacting uh, the world with the gospel. And so the question is, how can we in our context in this 21st century, how can we uh, get back to the original operating system and, and doing that? So uh, what we're going to be talking uh, about today is imagining this. Just put on your thinking cap uh, with me just for a moment. Imagine a world in which you and I would live of disciples of Jesus who make disciples of Jesus, who make disciples of Jesus. And we, we can talk about the struggles that we face as pastors, but the reality is this, is that if disciples made disciples made disciples, there would be no plateaued and declining churches. There would be no 900 Southern Baptist churches, 4,000 evangelical churches that would close their doors this year. It would solve that problem. Would you agree with me? Amen. Uh, what about fatherlessness? Uh, what about, uh, as we just talked about, addictions? <coughs> Yeah, the, the, the downstream problems that we have, that God's ultimate upstream solution for all the downstream problems is disciples who make disciples. Just imagine that. Imagine the world in which we would live of disciples making disciples who make disciples. It, it is a uh, transforming vision. And so this journey that we're going to be on, several things uh, that will uh, really, uh, that would be our objectives is, first of all, for you and I as a pastor and a leader, uh, that we uh, go to the next level in our spiritual growth and our spiritual health. Uh, and uh, so many times I've found this to be true. We who are good at giving out are wearing out, okay? Because we're always giving out. This is an opportunity for you and I as a pastor to receive and to be invested in and to go to the next level in our own spiritual growth. Uh, the church, it doesn't matter where your church is at. Uh, you know, I, uh, it, it, uh, can I say this? Is it all right for me to be transparent today? Doesn't matter how many people we baptize or how many people, what, what uh, the attendance was next week, it's never good enough. It, can I get a witness? You know, we always want to go better. So we can, how can we take our churches to the next level? And not just in attendance, but spiritual transformation. See our, our members look more like Jesus. And, uh, and less like Pharisees. And then, uh, and then uh, the personal growth, and then community growth. Uh, this, uh, this journey that uh, we've been on, I just came from Marietta High School meeting, or Marietta uh, City School Council meeting. Uh, 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 I, I don't know, uh, the Lord's just given a heart, and God's just opened up incredible opportunities uh, for us. And, I, and we'll talk more about uh, how we as kingdom leaders can think less like an established church pastor and more like a missional strategist. And how can we impact the people in our community uh, with the gospel. So this is the journey uh, that we're going to be on in doing that. So you say, no, Michael, what's, uh, what, what, is, what, what would we do if we're a part of this 18-month mentoring process? If I as a pastor uh, commit myself to this, and then I get three to four, or maybe uh, for some of us, it may be 10 to 15 of our leaders to come also and be a part of this. 
and I can tell you just experientially, we're on our third session now of, of, uh, of how uh, it's transformed our leadership in this whole journey and doing things that I know I couldn't have done in my own strength. So uh, uh, basically, uh, the, the uh, goal of this is growing our churches younger and uh, how can we uh, see uh, our older uh, generation investing the next generation. And uh, I'll tell you some stories that will really motivate you in just a moment. How can we uh, pass our faith on to the next generation? In other words, uh, how can we be effective parenting? Uh, Tom Rainer, uh, the now retired CEO of Lifeway, said if we just reach our own children, we would reach our next generation. And uh, how can we do that effectively even as pastors, parents, and grandparents? Uh, how can we do that? Uh, and then uh, getting our, our laity fully engaged. You know, one part of the Great Reformation that has not yet been fully realized is uh, the leasing, releasing of the laity and allowing them that there is, no, uh, there is no sacred and secular. If you're God's child, your king, God's kingdom goes wherever you're at in that educational place, in that workplace, wherever you're at in that neighborhood, it's uh, God's kingdom expanding. And, uh, and then allowing your church to look more like your neighborhood. Uh, what we have found is that, I just came from the Marietta City School meeting, 38% uh, of our community speaks Spanish. Uh, now my wife is from Mexico, so we automatically make up a multicultural church where I go to serve. And uh, uh, you know, people ask, oh, Michael, when y'all get in the intensive moments of fellowship, does Liliana speak to you in Spanish? We've been married 28 years. And uh, I wish she did speak to me in Spanish. And uh, but she speaks clear English. She understands every word that she has to say. And, uh, and so uh, what does that mean for us at Roswell Street? Four years ago, we were predominantly a mono-ethnic church. Today, we're one-third diverse. But really, we need to be uh, a third Spanish-speaking. We need to be a third African-American. And then we need to be a third uh, Anglo and Asian uh, to represent our community and uh, to be more missional in doing that. And I can tell you, uh, let me just uh, be uh, transparent. Is it all right for me to be transparent today? It is so painful. Yeah. It's difficult uh, because I'm amazed uh, at how many say that they love Jesus, but they can't love somebody who's different yeah. than them. Right. And uh, so we've seen uh, transition happen within our church, but we have seen a glorious salvations. I'll tell you about several of them in just a moment and uh, things that I never thought possible four years that ago that would happen uh, within Marietta at Roswell Street that are now happening. So uh, it's just amazing uh, to see that. So what we're going to be doing is we're basically going to be going to uh, the church's original code. Uh, you know, if, you're, if your phone locks up on you, if your phone locks up on you uh, or your computer locks up, what do you do? You go back to default. That's right. You, you reboot. Uh, and reboot goes, what it, what it does, it goes back to the original operating system. And so for us as church leaders, if what we've been doing hasn't been working, then what do we need to do? Because we're, we're, I mean, we're busier now in church life than what we've ever thought possible. So what, what do we do? What, we need to reboot and go back to the original code. And the original code is Jesus. And uh, Jesus gave us two great commands. He gave us a great commission and a great commandment. And then it, we sort of see what it looks like in Acts chapter 2. And that's what the Acts 2 journey is on. Uh, the great commission, go and make disciples of all ethnos, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things. Can you imagine being one of the early disciples and hearing Jesus say that? Can you imagine how overwhelmed they must have felt? I mean, they've hardly been out of Judea. And uh, Jesus is telling them to go into all the world and, uh, and then teach all things that I've commanded you. I mean, Jesus said a lot of things, didn't he? <laughs> Matter of fact, John, I love reading the Gospel of John, doing John in discipleship with my uh, four, young, four young fathers now. And I uh, love the last uh, couple of verses there. John says, if all the things that Jesus said and did were written, all the libraries of the world couldn't contain it. So you can imagine Andrew looking over at Bartholomew thinking, well, where are we going to start at? And Bartholomew responds, well, he said something about a great commandment. And uh, that's where we could begin to teach all these things. And what did Jesus say is the greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God, or your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and then love your what? Amen. Neighbor. And neighbor literally means near one. Let me give you a, an encouragement today, Pastor, the 
most important church member that you have is the one that you're married to. Amen. And the second most important church member that you have is the one that has your last name. The ones that have your last name. And so you're near ones and loving them well. And then out of that, then loving others, loving the church, loving the community, allowing that to take place. And so what, it, what, it, what does this even look like? It looks like Acts chapter 2. You know, they're devoting themselves to the apostle of doctrine, to breaking the bread. They're having fellowship one with another. And uh, what was the outcome of this? I mean, it, just think about it. They were selling their belongings, and if anybody had need, they were giving it. That, that's what you call radical generosity. Where is that in the American church? You know, I mean, it's, we have to strain to get a benevolence offering uh, to, to do that. And then, and, and notice the last part of it. What, what did the, law, what did the uh, outside culture that didn't know anything about the gospel, what were they doing? They were being added day by day. People wanted to be a part of some type of loving congregation, loving uh, missional group like this early church. And so what we're going to uh, be doing is we're going to be taking uh, these uh, Bible verses and then applying them into the life of our church. We'll do, a, uh, we'll do an exercise before we're through today to just give you a little touch and a taste of how this might, uh, uh, how we might desire uh, the Lord to do a fresh work uh, within us in, in our uh, local church ministries. Now, I know I'm... I'm here today, and I'm like you. Uh, Sunday's coming, so I've got got a uh, got a sermon to prepare. So, uh, let let me give you a, a very simplistic teaching. Or Wednesday night, uh, you might be teaching Wednesday night. Uh, Jesus, uh, this whole call to love through the Acts two journey. What's what's the call to love? Uh, Acts uh, or John chapter thirteen verses thirty four and thirty five. Jesus said, "A new commandment I give unto you, uh, that you love one another as what." as I've loved you, uh, so that you ought to love one another. And by this, all men shall know that you're my disciples if you put new carpet in the building. Hello, y'all with me? Now by this shall all men know that you're my disciples if you get a superstar preacher. Now I'm speaking American Christianity today. It's not biblical Christianity. By this shall all men know that you're my disciples if you what? Love one another. Okay. Now let me give you a, let me give you three thoughts that you can develop into a teaching outline or sermon outline. Uh, the first one is who is Jesus? Well, we find here in in this verse that he's given a new command. Now, question: who, Who's able to give commands? Only God. So what Jesus is saying: I'm God in a bod. I'm God in human flesh. And, uh, and, and uh, I gave you 10 to start with, but I'm giving you number 11 now. I'm giving you a new commandment. So here, so who is Jesus? He's God in human flesh, John chapter 1, verse uh, 14. And then uh, the second most, the second question is, is, is who are you? Who's Jesus? Who, who are you? Well, Jesus says here uh, that I have loved you. You know who you are? You're one who's loved by God. You're forgiven. Uh, you're, uh, you're accepted. You're approved. Uh, you are appreciated. <laughs> you are supported. Everlasting arms underneath us. That's who you are. You're loved. You realize this morning when you got up out of the bed, God says, oh, I'm so glad he's awake. He's a God of excited grace. He, he's thinking of ways that he could bless you and surprise you and start you with his love. That's who you are. You're loved by God. You say, well, I'm, I'm the pastor. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm this. No, the first uh, identity of who you are is that you're one who is loved by God. Uh, and then the, the third question is this. Who is Jesus? Who are you? And then the third question is, why, why am I here? Why am I here? Jesus said, a new commandment I give unto you, this is why you're here, that you do what? Love one another. Mark Twain said it this way. Mark Twain said, the two most important days of a person's life are the day that you're born and the day you know why. <laughs> and you know why we were born and even born again? We were born to love. And we were born to love like Jesus. 
The same God who gives us attention, we could give attention uh, to a brother or sister. Uh, we, we could, uh, uh, the same God who approves us uh, is the uh, same God who allows us to give that approval to others. Freely have we received from his love, freely can we give of his love. And so this whole call to love journey is going to be based out of this great commandment love, this, this loving as we have uh, received this love in our own personal life. And so uh, this is a, a powerful transformation. One way I like to say this is uh, great commission living is empowered by great commandment love. So we all want to be a part of great commission, right? And that's why we're here, great commission. Uh, but this great commission living is to be empowered by this great commandment love. And that's, uh, that's what uh, imagine. Now, now imagine this. Imagine taking a picture of your church this next Sunday. Okay? Everybody there. We just had our 75th anniversary at Roswell Street. So we got everybody in front of a camera, took a camera. And then imagine taking a picture of your church three years from now. My, our picture's already changed since last September, okay, uh, because of people who graduated to heaven, okay, new, new families that have come. Imagine taking a picture of your church 10 years from now. What would you imagine that church looking like? Can you imagine your church being filled with young families, filled with students, a lot, with senior adults? Could, could, you, could you imagine parents feeling uh, adequate and equipped uh, to raise up their children to be the next generation of Christian leaders? Uh, can, can you imagine your church looking more like a uh, three, five, 10, 15 mile radius around your church? Can you imagine the church that looks like that? Now, if you wanna know the diversity of uh, Bartow County, just go to the local school. Right, or you might say go to the local Walmart, uh, but you find out what the diversity looks like, and that's what our church that's the reason why God has our churches here to make that uh, difference. Now, listen to this statement. And David and I were talking about this the other day the, the lost culture outside is more willing to know about Jesus and love Jesus than what the church is willing to go and love them to uh, know about Jesus. And so what I'm finding is this, what I'm finding is this, the field is wide into harvest in your community, in my community, but my, my role as a missional strategist, as a local church pastor, is to get our church prepared for the harvest to come in. And it's coming. We just get, we've got to be ready for it and be prepared for it. And so that's what, uh, that's what this call to love is is all about. Now, let, let me share with you a couple of things that's happened uh, just to give you hope, okay? Uh, uh, our church, uh, as uh, David had described, uh, was on a rapid decline. Uh, I mean, we, we went from, I think, average of 3,000 members uh, back in 1997 uh, to about 600 members uh, four years ago. And so we were just on a rapid decline. But uh, let me tell you what the, the vision God gave in my heart was this disciple making uh, vision. And so we began with 13 discipleship groups. Uh, I, I took two young men, uh, Clayton and Jason, met with them at, uh, at Mountain Biscuits. Can I get a witness? <laughs> uh, and, uh, and we went there and we journeyed through eight to 10 months. We worked, worked through the Gospel of John. Uh, Jason now that I've discipled, uh, he's discipled 70 other men. He has this ministry called Summit Seekers. And then uh, Jason, uh, I mean Clayton, he's gone to Birmingham, Alabama uh, to plant a church. So that was pretty good discipleship number one, right? Now I'm on my seventh generation. I've got four young men that I meet with uh, every Saturday morning, Mountain Biscuits, which you call it base camp now. And uh, we're eating our biscuits and uh, we're in the Gospel of John, and, and here, here's Steve Gallman. Steve's been a leader in our church for years. Steve uh, said that he, he, uh, he's gotten vulnerable, he's gotten open in his own personal life, and he said, uh, he said, I just want to tell you about my witnessing opportunities last week. He said, I invited my neighbors over seats, and my wife said to me, oh, are neighbors that you've called idiots for 19 years? <laughs> he said, I was so embarrassed. He said, I invited them over to have game night at our house. We had a wonderful time. It gave us a great opportunity of conversations about Jesus that I never thought I would be possible. That's one. But John over here, John says, uh, this is what happened to my, for me this past week. My Mormon neighbor 
invited our family because they have six children. I guess they thought they were good prospects for Mormon. But Mormon family invited them over and said, we, I, got to, I got to go through the entire gospel presentation of my story with the entire Mormon family listening uh, to what a real relationship with Jesus looks like. And I'm going to tell you, every Saturday morning, it is, it's, like, it's like the needle moves in transformation. So we started off with 13 discipleship groups. And we're estimating now at Roswell Street there have been over 500 people that have gone through the disciple making process and it is multiplying every, every week, every month and new disciples who are making disciples who are making disciples. Uh, another thing that's happened for us is we're growing younger. Uh, if you went into Roswell Street uh, several years ago, you look like you one of my uh, friends that came from Texas, uh, David and Teresa, uh, they said we thought we went to a senior adult convention. <laughs> seriously but now uh, we've, we've taken a group that was stuck down in the gym with what they call contemporary music and we brought them all together and we created you say what kind of worship style do y'all have we call it authentic <laughs> now we might sing David Crowder and how great thou art I mean we just uh, it's amazing uh, the dynamic that's there but listen listen to uh, one of our college students that came into church the other day he said, Pastor, I can't wait to get to church on Sunday. I said, why is that? Uh, I thought he was going to say because of my preaching, but no, he's, he said because of Slater Baker. It's really? Slater's 86 years old. This is a college student. I said, what do you like about it? He said, I learned more wisdom in talking to Slater. He said, uh, Slater has been married for 63 years now. He said, I've never had anyone in my family make it past 10 years in marriage. And so when I see Slater sitting next to Miss Martha, it gives me hope. And I want to grow up and be like a Slater Baker. Wow, what a great, that intergenerational uh, movement that's taking place. And so uh, last year we had about three college students. We're averaging about 50 college students now, Sunday by Sunday. They're coming from seven different campuses. And there we never thought it was possible, uh, but it's becoming possible growing younger. And then uh, passing the faith on to the next generation, we're seeing parents uh, that are now uh, adequately uh, uh, imparting their faith to the next generation. We have one father this coming Sunday uh, that he realized that he needed to take a step of obedience and baptism, and uh, his daughter also is going to be baptized. And so we just see a, a real transformation that's taking place in parents that are really genuinely uh, following Christ and leading their uh, children to follow Christ. And then looking a lot more like our neighborhood. This past month, we added our 36th nationality uh, to our church family. Wow. And uh, so we're, uh, we're looking out there. My uh, daughters are away in college. They came back this summer, and they sing up in the choir. And if you've ever been at Roswell Street, the choir is way on up here. Said, Dad, I looked out, and they said, it looks more like heaven every Sunday. Mm -hmm. You know, becoming more and more like, uh, like uh, every tribe, tongue, and nation. And then engaging uh, Jesus followers missional living. So one thing that a part of this Acts 2 journey is that we'll lead you and also empower your leaders, uh, your lay leaders, so that you don't have to do it all by yourself as a pastor, uh, uh, but you'll in engage them. And so uh, we, we challenge our uh, members to live missionally. So uh, here's Miss Gwen uh, Wilson. Miss Gwen Wilson is 67 years old and uh, she uh, has to do some physical therapy and asthma is her physical uh, therapist. Uh, she's a student at Life University around the corner here. Asthma's from Saudi Arabia. And so they're trying to figure out their schedule and, and Gwen says, well, I can't go on Tuesday morning because I have Bible study at my church. Asthma said, Bible study? I've, I've always wanted to study the Bible. She said, well, it's Wednesday. Said, well, you could come uh, tonight our pastor's teaching the Bible study. So on Wednesday night, you know, you normally have your sleepy <laughs> group of Baptists that come in on Wednesday night. Asthma's in the back. Her eyes are wide open, smile ear to ear. I'm talking about justification by faith. I'm talking about who Jesus is. I'm talking about the joy of forgiveness of sin. And tears start flowing down Asthma's face. She's never heard it. And Gwen says she's never had a Bible before. She slid a Bible, open Bible over in front of her. And she, she, just, she was just so overwhelmed by it all. Afterwards, uh, Gwen introduced her to me. My daughter can't say this publicly, I won't say it by video, she's going to that part of the world uh, here in six months uh, and, 
And uh, so I was able to connect she and my daughter next Sunday. Uh, she comes to uh, asthma sitting on the second row with our daughter. And uh, after that, uh, we have lunch in my study because we're going to go see the movie Overcomer. And, uh, and so I said to asthma, my wife prepared lunch and we had it in my study. And so I said to asthma, I said, asthma, uh, it's the first time she's ever been to a Christian gathering. Never, first time she's ever been to a church. And I said, asthma, I said, well, what did you think? And she paused and she said, family. That's good. This is the closest to family I've ever experienced. And so the, the Mitchell living, that was a 72-year-old lady reaching a, a follower of Islam with the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's powerful. It's powerful. And so what we'll see is that we'll engage in this. Now, uh, if, if uh, about a year ago, before I even began this whole process, I was championing this, uh, this Great Commission, Great Commandment vision. Uh, but there was only probably about uh, five or ten other people around me that really got it. Now, at the end of a, a year-long journey that we've been on, I have, I have uh, at least a third of our leadership that is totally immersed into this vision. And uh, so what it does for you and I as leaders is it helps remove uh, that aloneness from their life, and it really uh, brings about a transformation. And so... Uh, what it's going to do, if you'll, if you'll look at this uh, sheet uh, right here, it gives you a little bit more detail, uh, but it's going to, it's going to help you, uh, take your church to the next level uh, in, uh, in transformation. So it's going to take you to a next level in worship and uh, fellowship and discipleship and uh, in outreach. So uh, your, your, uh, your sheet will say this, but it's, uh, it's 18, it'll be 18 months. We're actually going to do uh, six coaching sessions. Uh, uh, the training, the coaching, the leadership development, and it's not me as the whole team uh, that's going to be coming and representing uh, the Great Commandment Network, and uh, it'll basically help rediscover your purpose. So uh, imagine this. Imagine your worship service going to the next level. Uh, imagine your fellowship going to the next level. Uh, imagine your evangelism uh, going to the next level. Imagine your uh, your service and your discipleship, your growth, going to the next level. So no matter where we, you may be at, I may be at, uh, as a part of this journey, we're going to be going to the next level and uh, in doing that. And that's not the same for every church, right? Uh, it's, it's very different. It's very unique uh, for each one of us in doing that. Okay? So uh, in, uh, in, in doing this, uh, it's going to bring... Uh, uh, several things you'll notice on your sheet uh, is uh, this 12 and 18 month, if you'll notice this third bullet point down here, uh, there will be personally living out the call to love testimony. It'll be reshaping your church culture. Now, let me just say this uh, again. Can I be vulnerable with you? All right. Can I be transparent? Everybody with me? Uh, is uh, we could come up with some great mission statements and we could come up with some great vision statements. <coughs> But listen to this statement. Culture will eat mission and vision for lunch every week. And until that culture's changed, uh, then uh, then it'll, nothing will line up with that. And so what this will do is will help reshape the culture. Uh, it'll deepen uh, caring connections with your family. Uh, listen to what one of my leaders said. He said, I've been in church 40 years and spoke uh, about uh, Albert. He said 40 years and I never knew what his wife's name was. That I'm going to tell you, a lot of times we think that we know one another, but we really don't know one another. For the whole month of August, I had our church members come in and write their name down on a name tag and put it on their name tag. It was like revival meeting. I mean, it was uh, people began just to wake up and realize who one another, uh, who, who each other is, and uh, doing that. So it'll develop fresh perspective for your church's mission. It'll give uh, spirit-empowered outcomes, and it'll replicate this call to love training principles uh, in doing that, uh, uh, now you say. Now, what what are you uh, what are you inviting us to do? Uh, there there'll be one full day of training, okay? Because we uh, uh, David was sharing with me about the number of bivocational pastors that are here in Bartow County, and uh, and so one one full day. So it'll be one Saturday a quarter that we'll be coming together. 8.30 to 12 o'clock will be just pastors and if your wives are able to come along with you 
I, I find it's very beneficial for them to come. And then at noon, we would invite your, uh, your leadership team or your vision team. That could be three to four lay leaders. Uh, it could be couples. It could be individuals uh, that could come to be a part of that. Or it may be like us. I mean, I have uh, many of our leaders that come uh, to those Saturday gatherings. As many as that you can uh, come for that. And then they would stay from uh, noon until 3.30. And what will happen is this. As pastors, we want to prepare you before your leadership gets here to know what uh, what you're going to be talking about because it's not just all uh, instruction. Uh, there's a lot of sharing. So in our last uh, in our last uh, uh, coaching session, I was sitting with a group of our leaders, and I'm going to tell you, uh, they were sharing some things about the vision that God was giving them. Uh, that just just fueled me. I mean, it just so encouraged me. And uh, matter of fact, uh, I'm, I'm going to be doing an entire sermon series in the month of December based on the conversation that we had at our table. And uh, so it's just really, really powerful. When you put leaders in the room and uh, maybe leaders who have never thought in kingdom terms, uh, it really brings about <coughs> a, a generational uh, transformation. Uh, within the life of the church. So uh, th these are some of the things that are going to be happening. Uh, we're going to be, uh, our first one, or session number one, is going to be February the 1st. Uh, so you've got some time ahead of you. And uh, you'll notice the timing. Uh, pastors and spouses, 8.30 to 12. Pastors and your vision teams from 12 to 3.30. Now, I know for you and I as a pastor, can I, can I bear witness with you? You think, man, how in the world can I give an all Saturday to this? And, and can I be transparent? It's all right for me to be transparent. But my first Saturday meeting, I thought there is no way under heaven I'm going to be able to stay. You know, uh, no way I'm going to be able to get my leadership here. Uh, but I, I made a commitment. I said, all right, Lord, by faith, I'm going to do it. And by faith, I'm going to invite my key leaders to come. And I'm going to tell you, uh, the day went by so fast because of the conversations around the table. And second of all, this is the second question I was asking my, my lay leaders, were they, you know, are they going to benefit from it? Here's their question. When's the next one, Pastor? Thank you for inviting me to the table. Thank you for allowing me to have this conversation. Thank you. One, one of my business leaders, who is a uh, president of a company, he said, I've been to many corporate trainings, and he said nothing has touched me and empowered me deeper than what I had in that one day. So it's amazing, uh, amazing the uh, what what takes place uh, in those sessions. So uh, that's what's going to be happening. You'll notice on the back there, there's a thousand dollar grant per church that's a uh, that is available to the first 25 churches that register. You say where do I sign up? You'll find all that information down there. So let's uh, let me stop talking just for a moment. And, uh, and then what I want to do is I want to lead you into what we would call the uh, biblical functions assessment. So uh, no, matter what, uh, no matter what church strengthening strategy you, you go through, uh, they would identify out of Acts chapter 2, these are the five biblical functions of the local church. Uh, worship, discipleship, fellowship, evangelism, and ministry. Some call it worship, grow, connect, grow, go, and serve. Uh, so what I want us to do at this time is let's, let's take just a moment and uh, let's assess uh, where we're at as a local church. So what I want you to do uh, is to walk through each one of these. Uh, uh, it says biblical uh, function of worship, and here would be an example. Uh, our uh, worship is spirit-empowered and reflects a sense of reverence for God and His holiness. And uh, this pastor put, not at all. That's not happening at all uh, in our church. And then uh, our worship supports the spiritual growth of our congregation and inspires us to live out our faith in the world. And he put down here uh, three, uh, which would be sometimes, okay? So what you want to do is whatever row you put it in, like a one, uh, you'll put one. If it's in the third column, you'll put number three. And then you're going to be adding those up in that. Y'all see that? Okay. So we're going to take a moment. We're going to do a spiritual assessment our biblical assessment of where we're at. And uh, let me encourage you, every eye look this way, let me encourage you, uh, because I, I am one of you, all right? Uh, don't have a halo effect. You say, now, what, uh, Michael, what are you talking about having a halo effect? This is this. Don't have on here what you hope is true. Uh, simply just reflect in your heart about what you know to be true and what it actually is. Because what it does, uh, and, and if I could be, 
uh, you know, real with you in this. Uh, for me, uh, in a lot of these assessments, I was uh, on the one column, okay, in our church. But as a result of uh, three years on this journey now, I can see how the needle has moved. And so, uh, if you will, let's take just a moment. We're going to take about, uh, we give you incredible video resources that you could use based on what you've experienced in the session. Uh, you'll be able to get your vision team or your leadership team, whatever you call that, uh, together. So this past uh, Wednesday night a week ago, I had my vision team together, as many as of them that could come, and uh, we watched a video and then we did some discussions on it. And I'm going to tell you, we went from right here and we just went deep. I mean, the, the conversations around that, and really it, it, uh, it just helps me because uh, I'm like you, my, my schedule's busy, to have resources that correlate with the journey that we're on that helps uh, deepen that conversation. Uh, there will also be uh, each one of the workbooks that you'll get uh, have QR codes. Uh, so uh, your, you and your leaders that go through that uh, can easily pull up a video on that, uh, go through uh, the material. Uh, so it's very user friendly is what I want to say to you. And then also there are some great resources like the uh, Acts 2 book, uh, Alton Garrison that wrote that, and then the Great Commandment Network or the Great Commandment Principle book by Dr. Ferguson. So those are some of the books, uh, resources that will also be a part of this journey. So let me pause right there and uh, let me ask you, are there any uh, impressions or any questions that you might have uh, about the, this uh, invitation that David uh, is giving to you, I'm giving to you uh, as a trainer uh, from this group? On those Saturdays, these two sessions go back to back at noon. Is lunch provided? Do we bring stuff? What? Correct. So lunch will be provided, snacks, uh, coffee. Uh, will be provided during that time. Mountain biscuits included. Uh, I wish so. <laughs> uh, that's a that's a good outfit. We, we're uh, we we uh, we actually you know we talk about not just uh, exploring the scripture but actually experiencing the Bible. So we we experience that Bible verse that says, "Taste and see that the Lord is good." It's <laughs> good. Great, great question. Any other questions or impressions? You think this might be beneficial? Definitely. Yeah. Right. Good. Guys, I, I want to just, Michael, stay right here for just a second. Let me tell you, I've been walking through when y'all been doing the quarterly meetings, I've been coming down. The last one I went to had the best training on conflict stuff I've ever seen. And I was sitting there going, why didn't they give me this in seminary? Because <laughs> it was incredibly practical. And uh, but what I've seen is, when you, you walk through it, this and then you put your leadership people, gosh, you can never have church move forward unless the, the pastor and the leaders are together. Mm -hmm. If it's not together, and Tim, you've seen this, as soon as the pastor leaves, it snaps back. And what we want is we don't want to create a, a personality driven church. We want to see a church really move forward to where it is built to last. I mean, yes. it really is built to last. Mm -hmm. now listen, November the 8th is a Friday. And at Roswell Street, they'll be meeting with the uh, the pastors. Yeah. If you want to go with me, you can. And because uh, I'll be going to Roswell Street that day, because I've been going through this training, and I wasn't going to offer something to you unless I had been, I'd really looked at it and, and, and really kind of gotten in depth. Their resources, and you know, it's not just in the meeting, it's the resources, Michael. The first stuff that they've written, I was like, man, that's really good. God, that's good. Some of the ideas, I've been really, really impressed. Mm -hmm. so, so, so here's what you know, okay? It costs you two thousand dollars, but the first twenty-five churches that sign up, they gift gifted a, a thousand. Okay, so you know, is it going to cost you something? Yes. Over eighteen months, that's not that much. Mm -hmm. And but I would say this: of all the stuff that I've seen, that I think church health, and, and that's where I've spent more time doing stuff than any other thing. I think this is the best church health process. Mm -hmm. It's a process. It's mm -hmm. not a. It's not, not, a, a, not a silver bullet. It's not a silver yeah. bullet. It is not a silver But it's a process of that a church gets to go through its leadership that uh, ultimately makes, I think, the best thing that, that I've seen. Mm -hmm. So, Amen. all right, guys. If you have any questions, you can always ask me. But if you want to go on November the 8th, go ahead and check your calendar and say, hey, I want to ride. You can go with me. 
everything will be taken care of. And yes, we do go from Rosal Street, we went out to the Krispy Kreme, which is right <laughs> down the road. Tim, you know where it is. Right, which has a hot mail, right. but yeah. well, uh, you said the eighth. That's a Friday. That's a Friday. Yeah. Right. So, so we're we're in our third session. Uh, mm -hmm. And what we do uh, in the setup where we're at, we do a Friday training for pastors, and then they Saturday their leadership comes with them all day Saturday. So. What David uh, has, has uh, suggested that would work better for you, and I think he's uh, spoken to several of you as pastors, is that all day Saturday, uh, Saturday training just with pastors the morning, and then the afternoon pastors and their leadership teams uh, would work out best just to do it one day. And rather than do uh, four coaching sessions, uh, Friday, Saturdays, uh, do six uh, Saturday meetings. Uh, for 2020 and then 2021, half of 2021. Guys, so many of our guys are bivocational and talking with different people. They're like, okay, and we looked at maybe a Sunday afternoon, mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff. So what they've done is they kind of work to say, okay, we got all these guys at work during the week, so this actually fits. Mm -hmm. uh, let, let me tell you something about, you, you notice uh, on the calendar, the Galatians 6-6 six, six retreats. Mike, have y'all done, what, over 14,000 couples have been through this? 14,000 couples uh, all over the world, and it's, it's specifically uh, for pastors and their wives, and it's totally gifted. So it's a $900 gifting uh, for you and your wife just to be blessed, to be encouraged, and uh, to be empowered. My wife and I went to one 18 years ago. And we're still working out all the good things God worked in us. It's been phenomenal. It's not only helped us uh, in our marriage, took our marriage. We had a good marriage, but it took us to a whole nother level of closeness with God and with each other. And then uh, second thing, it gave us tools to parent. Uh, and then it really helped me uh, become more of a relational leader within the local church. Uh, so uh, this is a gifted retreat. There are still, I think, four or five more openings uh, for next week, which is Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. I think David's already sent an email out to you. But if you want a brochure, we've got some brochures up here about that. It'll probably be another year before we have another one uh, in this area. So I know it's a last, uh, you know, we're less than a week away. But if your schedule would work, uh, it would be great. My wife and I co-lead it. Uh, and then another couple, uh, equipping couple, will be with us as well. And uh, it is so transformative. It's more than just, uh, you know, if you've ever gone to a marriage workshop or something like that, you sit still while somebody instills. Uh, but uh, this one, you do just what we did right now. There's, uh, there's the equipping part of it, but then you and your wife share. You don't share with other couples. You and your wife share and uh, with each other in that context. And it is very transformational uh, and, uh, and encouraging. And, uh, you know, we as uh, ministry couples, we're, we're uh, uh, all about your wife's probably like mine, involved in, in many people's lives, but this is just a great time uh, to come aside. And we're at uh, Historic Banning Mills. I don't know if you've ever been there before. Uh, the longest zip lines in the world are in his not that you got to do zip lining but if you wanted to uh, uh they're they're available but it's a beautiful place and they tell me i think i saw it they actually have rooms in trees uh, i'm not rooms and trees convince yeah. my wife do that <laughs> my wife and i are actually getting to go uh next week and you know guys it's crazy the last time my wife and i got away by ourselves mm -hmm. was when we did the uh pastors and wives retreat up in the mountain and that's because of you know family situations with her dad and our daughter. But I got a daughter who's finally going to come, and it's going to be the first time we've been away in six years together, which I guarantee you we, we need that. But right, that's yeah. one of the things that you don't get to go next week. I'm telling you, every one of you guys uh, need to go. But uh, what I want to encourage you to do is to be thinking about going through this. And some of you are thinking, well, I'm not a senior pastor. I'm telling you guys it's still worth your time to go through it because of what you'll learn. So anyway, from here, here here's what we know. Uh, there's some people that aren't here today because they're out working and stuff like that. We'll send out this. And so if you know some other pastors and stuff like this, say, hey, be sure to watch that because it's something for you to give careful consideration. I can't sign you up. You and you got to sign your own church up. And uh, But here's what I know, guys. And we've got this crazy reality right now in Bartow County. The, the community is begging for our 
help in the community. And if our churches aren't healthy, we'll never be able to step into the reality. And I'm telling you the losses right now, everywhere I go, everywhere I go. Wesley, you and I went to a place the other day and we, we couldn't even get our order taken because the woman just wanted to talk. She just she just sat there and just yeah. started pouring because all we did was ask. And I'm telling you guys, the greatest receptivity right now, and especially this younger generation, how did you say it? They're high tech and low touch. They're high tech and low touch, and it will touch them. They they want relationships, and but we just got to make sure that we're doing that. So part of this is with what I see God doing in Bartow County, like a school superintendent saying, "Hey, here's come come help us in elementary school." The degree that we're doing that, if our churches aren't healthy, we're not going to be able to to seize our moment. So yeah. what I see is God putting all this stuff together where the community inside the church all of it put together in a, in a moment in time so you know what i'm doing is i'm saying hey guys this is the best thing i've seen and i'm saying to you pray about it and see if your church is supposed to be a part of it so yeah. all right michael thank you for coming and mm -hmm. listen i'll see you next monday yeah, yeah. for the yeah. first time without, yeah. with, with, <laughs> with just my wife just the two of us which would be nice but uh guys before we leave we don't leave without praying and uh, what I want to ask you to do is, is do something very, very simple. I want to give you a time to pray right now personally. I want you to pray for your church to become the healthiest <coughs> church that she's ever been. Don't pray that it's healthier than the church down the street. Pray that your church becomes all that God has called her to be. I want you to pray that right now for your church. <coughs> 